Hi, everybody. My name is Brady Scott. I'm here with my colleague, Dr. Sarah Barakogis, and we are presenting So You Want to Present at an AARC Meeting. So the objectives of this talk are to review the AARC Program Committee goals, to review the RFP or the Request for Proposals process, discuss common difficulties encountered during committee proposal review, and to discuss opportunities for successful committee proposal review. So who are we? I'll start with myself. So uh, my name is Brady Scott. I am currently an associate professor in the respiratory care program at Rush University in Chicago. And as of this recording, I am the, the current chair of the program committee. Dr. Varikogis is a past chair of the program committee. Sarah, I'll let you introduce yourself. Hello, everybody. My name is Sarah Varikogis, and I'm currently a professor of respiratory therapy at The Ohio State University for both our undergraduate entry to practice and our graduate APRT programs. Um, I have served as a past chair of the program committee, and Brady and I have lots of experience as well. As you can see, both of us, we've had a combined 12 years on the program committee. Both of us have, have served as chair. Again, I'm current chair. Uh, we've reviewed what thousands of presentation proposals and have actually populated CRCE content for over uh, at least 20 tracks of the ARC meetings, including the Summer Forum and the International Congress. So let's start with who is the program committee? What do we do? So first, the program committee is a, a group of volunteers, as you can see in the middle box, um, that uh, represent one or more areas of clinical practice in respiratory therapy, respiratory care, um, you know, maybe adult acute care, a neonatal pediatric, we'll get in that in a moment. There's also uh, committee members that represent respiratory care journal, the journal. Uh, so there's a person or at least uh, some individual that's there from the journal to represent their interests as well. We are appointed each year by the AARC president and, um, Everybody on the committee would have some sort of previous program ex uh, planning experience or a very active involvement in their clinical practice areas. So what are the goals of the committee? Well, really at the end of the day, so if you look at the diagram on the screen here, you can see that in the middle, of this, in the circle in the middle, you can see that the goal is to ensure that the attendee has uh, really... Um, when you think about somebody who is attending the summer forum or international congress that they have the best educational experience possible and that we put together a a meeting that has the right combination of topics and speakers to deliver uh, the talks on those topics and so you can see around that circle so we try to ensure balance of um uh, foundations and and new discoveries uh things that are fundamental to respiratory therapists uh, that we're trying to update or versus new things that are coming out in the profession. Um, ensure dissemination of that new knowledge to make sure that when attendees come to the Congress, they're learning something new that can take back to their practices in their respective institutions and provide information attendees can use to improve patient outcomes. At the end of the day, that's what that, this is all about. It's about our patients, it's our students, it's our teams that we're with to make sure that our outcomes are, are improved. And, and really and help promote and provide and improve the practice of respiratory therapy. So we always start with this process, what we call request for proposals. And the, the, there's a the couple of reasons that we have this process. First is to solicit presentation propos proposals from respiratory therapists like you, physicians or other healthcare uh, team members. And so, um, and also we want to hear about topics that are of interest to membership. So the, the RFP process serves two purposes. What are members interested in? And then what ideas are out there uh, by uh, various members of the healthcare team? Keep in mind, it's not just for respiratory therapists to submit uh, uh, proposals. So we have, as mentioned before, we have several different uh, content areas uh, of interest. And so you can see on the screen there in a the box, I'm just kind of going to go from left to right. You can see we have uh, proposals. Uh, uh, when, we, when we're looking for proposals, we, we're looking for content areas such as adult acute care, uh, ambulatory post-acute care, diagnostics, education, ethics, leadership and management, neonatal pediatrics, patient safety, pulmonary function testing, sleep, and transport. So there's 
lots of different content areas that a, a speaker can submit for a potential spot on the agenda. And so these content areas align with the AARC and MBRC specialty sections and credentials, practice area, AARC initiatives, and state licensure renewal requirements. So the request for proposal, proposal process begins quite early, sorry. So uh, I remember before I became a program committee member, I didn't understand why it was so early. So that's kind of one of the things that Dr. Varicogis and I wanted to discuss here was the fact that it is early and there's a few reasons why. One, uh, one we, the, pers the individual that's responsible for like the section or the content area has to review uh, the content or have, to, or have to review the proposals. Um, we have to meet as a committee. We go through this process of reviewing and selecting the actual content or the topics and the speakers. We have to consider content and topics for both the Summer Forum and the AARC International Congress. Uh, then we have to invite the speakers. There has to be notification of whether or not the proposal was accepted or denied. And then we have to confirm to make sure that the speakers can still actually show up and give the talk. And then uh, the executive office and, and, and many, many people have to do things like build the, the Congress or Summer Forum website. Uh, they have to open up registration. Their program has to be done. So there's a lot of work from the time that the request for proposals opens up to the actual meeting. We have to give enough time uh, for that process. And I'll just be honest with you. <laughs> and now that I understand the process, um, I under, I, it, it's, a lot, uh, it's more clear to me now why, why it begins so early. Mm -hmm. so just a reminder so um because it is early if you if if at the end of the day you can always be thinking always really at any time of the year be thinking about uh something that's new and exciting uh that would need to be discussed at the at the meeting and so get started now on your proposal uh we'll talk more about this later there's ways to 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 know how to do this. Uh, you can speak to a committee member. You can speak to the uh, specialty section uh, chair uh, of the of the specialty section that you're interested in. So there's a lot of ways to to get ideas of how to do this. And so so get started now. And then once you submit the uh, the your actual request for proposal, your request for a talk, save that date. Right. So save the date that way. Once we go through the review and we send an invitation that you're still available to actually come to the meeting. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to kick this to Dr. Vera Kojic, and she's going to talk about the anatomy of a proposal and those things that go into putting together a really strong proposal. Thank you, Brady. So um, just a quick kind of overview, I guess, of what's included in the RFP. So title, objective, description, speaker information, speaker financial support, and speaker experience. So I'm going to go back to the top for the title. So from the program committee's perspective, um, um, you know, a catchy title is fun and exciting, um, but if it doesn't clearly indicate kind of what the presentation will be about, it's really challenging for the committee to be able to accept or to select that proposal. Um, so really carefully think about the title and make sure that the title kind of captures what, you're, what you really want to say. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about objectives and description here in a minute, so we're going to kind of hit pause for that. But the speaker information is really exactly what you think it is, your name, your contact information, your place of employment, those kinds of things. It tells us a little bit about you. Um, speaker financial support. Um, um, there's a section where you indicate um, what kind of financial support you would require to be able to deliver this presentation. So speakers that are able to present on a gratis basis or with little financial support are a fiscally responsible choice for the committee. However, if you need financial support in order to be able to, um, to submit your, to present your proposal, um, if you need airfare, hotel, honorarium compensation, make sure you include this in your proposal submission. This is one of the very last things that the committee considers when we're making selections. Um, the need for financial support will not preclude your proposal from being accepted, but not asking for financial support may actually prevent you from being on the podium and making the presentation if you didn't ask for it, but it's necessary. Um, and then last, speaker experience. Again, we'll talk a little bit more about this, but list any previous speaking engagements with the 
the, what was the conference that you were speaking at or the meeting that you were speaking at, um, the title, the topic that you presented, um, if you have any recordings that were that were created of pre previous presentations, if you can include a link, people have done that before for us. If you have a summary evaluation that was completed um, at any previous presentations, you can include that, we've seen those. Um, really just anything that you can think of that will help to demonstrate to the committee that you have kind of that speaker experience that would be necessary to be successful presenting um, at a national conference. Um, one thing that's really important about getting your proposal noticed by the program committee is the topic. So just a couple of things. Topic must be novel, relevant, and timely. So timely, relevant, it reflects contemporary issues that are facing the profession. Um, and that the topic has broad appeal. Um, a niche topic might be interesting or even very exciting, but remember the committee is striving to ensure that really all attendees have the best educational experience, and that means the right combination of topics and speakers, and that the program provides information that attendees can kind of take home with them. That important takeaway message is is really, really vital. So uh, again, a niche might be interesting and exciting, but it might not have that broad appeal that allows for an important takeaway message for the most attendees. Also, back to the objectives and descriptions. So one of the things that's really going to affect whether your proposal is noticed by the committee or not is the, is the combination of objectives and descriptions. So they obviously must be clearly written and have an indication of what the attendee will gain. The objectives must be behavioral. They must um, be distinctly different. If you have two objectives that basically say the same thing, again, that's not going to get your proposal noticed. The submitted description is what's published in the program. So be very, very careful and make sure it really highlights the relevancy of the topic that you've selected, um, that you indicates what the attendees will be able to take away, that they'll be able to take with them back at the conclusion of the presentation. And then also, the other thing that will get your proposal noticed is that the speaker is able to demonstrate expertise on the topic. When I mentioned including the speaker experience in the proposal, this is why. The committee is looking for someone with the right combination of experience and expertise to include on the program. And just a couple of words about demonstrating expertise on a topic. So previous experience presenting at a state or regional meeting on the topic or a very closely related topic is important. And you also should likely have specific work experience that informs the presentation. I work in education. Yes, I have some clinical um, application of that of that role, but I also, again, I work in education. So me presenting on a topic that's highly clinical, that is very intricate about what's happening at the bedside, I can't really kind of demonstrate to the committee that I have that work experience or that I have that background that would be necessary to be successful. There's lots of other ways to demonstrate expertise on a topic. So a published article in a professional publication related to the topic is one way. Some people automatically assume this means a research manuscript in a research journal. And while that's one way, the committee also gives a lot of credibility to newsletters, patient education publications, any commentaries that might have, you might have written, editorials that you've submitted. So lots of different kinds of publications are included as a way of demonstrating expertise. And we look at all of those things. I would also encourage you to consider volunteering to present on your topic at another meeting, at a different meeting, prior to submitting it to AARC. So consider hospital or health, sim, health system continuing education conferences, um, state society annual meetings, state affiliates of patient advocacy groups oftentimes either have patient presentations or again to their, to their constituents as well. So there's lots of different opportunities and I would really encourage you to also ask the organizers of these events to share any feedback that they collect from the participants that will help you kind of as you are developing your presentation skills. Another way to demonstrate your expertise and experience as a speaker is to participate in the Speaker Academy. It is not available every year, but if it will be offered, the announcement will be made at the same time as the request for proposals. You do submit a full proposal for the Speaker Academy, title, objectives, description, everything that we've talked about so far. And then if you're selected, you'll be asked to present an abbreviated presentation to an expert panel. 
I want to note that that expert panel will provide feedback directly to you, regardless of whether your proposal is accepted or not. So that's an excellent way to get some feedback, especially as you're getting started um, as, on a national level doing presentations. If you are selected from the Speaker Academy, um, you will be placed, your, your proposal, your talk will be automatically placed on the next Congress program. So this is an excellent opportunity. Um, again, when it's offered, pay attention and really consider um, participating as a way to develop your expertise. As we wrap up kind of this section on the proposal itself, um, I do want to just say a couple of words about co-presenters. So there's kind of a lot of reasons um, that people add co-presenters when they're submitting their proposal um, to share the content of the presentation as an obvious one. Um, I think sometimes we also have seen that it's to help demonstrate expertise. Um, a co-presenter, a carefully selected co-presenter can help with that. I also think sometimes it's just to have a friendly face on stage. Um, you, everybody always likes to present with their friends. So, and not that there's anything necessarily wrong with that. However, just a couple of notes from the committee. Um, you know, usually we're considering um, presentation slots that are about 25 to 30 minutes each. A co-presenter is not usually necessary for a 25 to 30 minute presentation. So you need to make sure it's very clear why you need a co-presenter. If it's not clear to the committee, it is likely that the committee will only select one of the presenters that were submitted. So be very, very careful about when you are considering adding a co-presenter. I also want to note that you cannot add a co-presenter after the presentation has been accepted. Um, it's really just, it's not possible to do um, with the way we review proposals and the way we put the meeting together. Um, just a couple of words here about decline proposals. So we've talked about kind of what you need in your proposal, some advice about putting that together. And then these are some things that um, the, the committee, as we're reviewing, these are some things the committee kind of up, comes up against um, that makes it challenging for us to accept proposals. So number one, the objectives are not unique from each other. I mentioned that before. Again, they need to be uniquely different so that the committee can clearly see what the participants are going to gain. And again, they're not behavioral in nature. Um, so that's really important. Take a step back and really um, think about that. Um, the objectives and or the description are vague and do not clearly indicate the content. We're not going to guess um, at what you really mean um, if it's not really clear. And then just kind of from a housekeeping thing, these are kind of your basics, but the proposal did not adhere to the word count. Um, I can't tell you how many times we get to the end of a sentence and, or we get to the end of a line and it's not the end of the sentence. And it was clearly, there was probably a copy paste going on. Not that we discourage you from using a word processing program to develop your objectives and description, but just be aware that in the RFP system, there are, there are word count limits on all of the boxes. And so when you go to copy paste, if you've gotten a little verbose, we might be missing part of your um, proposal. And then obviously we're not going to be able to accept it. Um, again, also kind of just some basics. Um, if it appears to be a commercial or an advertisement for a particular program or a product, it will not be accepted. Um, the committee really feels that that's not appropriate. Um, we also get um, RFPs sometimes that actually read more like an open forum presentation, um, and we will actually communicate with the submitter of those proposals and encourage them to submit an abstract for um, consideration for the open forum. If it appears to be, a uh, again, a research uh, study um, and it's more suited for that, we will communicate. Um, getting to a few more kind of advanced reasons why um, proposals are not accepted, um, we frequently get topics, um, submissions for topics that were presented in recent years, and really there's not a whole lot new to present on that topic. And so it, we have very, uh, you know, very strong constraints on our time, how many proposals we can accept, how many slots we have to fill in each meeting. And so while it might have been well written, the proposal might have been well written, if it's a topic that we feel has already been covered recently and there's really nothing new, we won't be selecting that topic. Um, we also have this happen a lot. Topic was submitted multiple times. To, you know, topics that are important, that are timely, that are relevant, that are really, really um, kind of a big issue for respiratory therapists. We frequently get multiple submissions on that same topic. And so we oftentimes have to sit down and kind of compare across those multiple submissions um, 
which one had the most clear objectives and description, which one had the best indication of a takeaway or maybe even um, the best takeaway from the committee's perspective. And then also looking at um, demonstrated expertise of the speaker. So um, again, if you see your topic represented on the program, but it wasn't specifically your proposal, my guess is that you might need to really kind of um, going to go back and think about your title, your objectives, and your description, and make sure that they're very, very clearly written and clearly indicate your takeaway. The other thing that we see sometimes is that one speaker will submit a proposal in every category. And I'm just going to say, I think it's very difficult for one person to be an expert in all aspects of respiratory therapy practice. Um, you know, I could I could read a textbook about pulmonary function technology. That's not a, a topic that I teach. That's not an area where I practice. And I could read a textbook and I could put together a proposal. But I don't, the committee is oftentimes looking at that saying, well, this person doesn't have demonstrated expertise. This is not, they don't have any work experience. They don't have any publications. They don't have any presentations. So I'm not really sure what the quality of that would be. So just make sure that you really are focusing on what your areas of expertise are and what you really have something to share, important to share from your background, your um, experience with the audience. And then again, I, I, I feel like I keep harping on this, but it's really, un, if it's unclear to the committee, if the speaker has previous speaking experience, we do not want to put an inexperienced speaker on a national stage in front of hundreds of people. Um, that's a, that's a, challenging situation for experienced speakers oftentimes to be in front of the large groups that we see at Congress. And so we don't want to do that to uh, a speaker that really doesn't have any previous experience. Um, on the flip side, we do want to support our new speakers. And so we're going to transition to the program. And Brady's going to talk to you a little bit about kind of as we put the program together, some of the things that we think about. Sure. Thanks, Sarah. That was excellent. So there's a few things that we do. There's a couple slides here that we'll talk and we'll talk about each one of these components. So as we're starting to put together um, uh, the actual program, start to build it out, right? One of the very first things we do as committee members is we reach out to specialty section chairs and we quite literally ask them about these so-called must-have topics, meaning that we have to have this topic at the Congress this year. And we do that for like myself, like adult acute care and Sarah for education and, and then others in leadership and transport and so on. And really at the end of the day, we want to make sure that um, we can represent the, the, the um, what others are seeing as well, not just the committee members, right? Mm -hmm. So, and this is part of the review process. So we have these must have topics and we make sure that, hey, you know, uh, a lot of people, a lot of like for now, uh, obviously COVID-19 has been a big deal. Uh, we're learning more about COVID-19 and uh, uh, prone positioning, for example, or COVID-19 and escalation to things like BV ECMO. So these topics come up and we, we make sure that we, uh, you know, we're looking for those during the review process. And just as a side note, um, you know, if you're thinking of, if you're thinking about a proposal, you know, you can always connect with your section chair for uh, topics and, and those hot, hot topics and discuss these things as you're preparing for your own proposal. Um, we, uh, some of the committee members like somebody submitting a proposal, we both groups will review things like AARC Connect and AARC Publications, looking for uh, topics of interest in the current RT workforce. Uh, committee members are all the time uh, monitoring new publications and new trends uh, to make sure that when we have a meeting that, you know, some of this newer, as Dr. Verico just mentioned, you know, novel, timely things are represented uh, during during the, the conference. And again, and so what you can do and what we also do, so these slides kind of move towards both groups in reality, is to look at a variety of publications and determine emerging topics of interest to the RT workforce. So like myself, I not only look at respiratory care uh, publications, I look at publications that relate to what we do, like critical care publications. And I try to, I try, you know, as the person who helps create some of the adult acute care content, make sure that I'm monitoring all kinds of different avenues to see what, what might be relevant and timely and, you know, use that information to say, okay, well, 
you know, we, we need to have this discussion. This is a trend. This is a shift in practice that impact us. These are new guidelines that are coming up based on the evidence. And that really is how we kind of imagine how the program is ultimately going to come out. So you can see that it's a combination. It's like how the program comes together is this amalgamation of, of the program committee members speaking with specialty section chairs uh, and everybody to, in reality, it's everybody monitoring and, and looking at trends and changes and guidelines and things that need to be, need to come together. So whenever you make a decision to uh, come to the meeting or anybody, any attendee uh, makes a decision to come to the meeting that their educational needs are met. And so again, putting it together, we will, you know, the committee is charged with reviewing the details about uh, a person's speaking experiences and, and other activities that demonstrate expertise, as Sarah pointed out earlier. Publications uh, doesn't even necessarily have to be peer reviewed. You know, she laid those kind of things out. But think about we're trying to find the expert in the area that can present on what they know. And, you know, this is a large international conference. So expertise is important here. And so we will look at the details and try to understand uh, if we're not familiar with a speaker. Sometimes what we do is we reach out to colleagues that might be familiar with you as a speaker or other speakers and talk about, you know, where they've seen uh, the individual talk and, and, and how did it go. And we really put a lot of effort to make sure that the right speaker is speaking on the topic that is, is uh, necessary for that year's conference. And I do want to point out, though, is that we do intentionally review the program as it's being developed to ensure that we are incorporating new speakers. That is something that every year I've been on the committee, uh, it is a, always a conversation of how many new speakers are getting a chance at, at, at showing their expertise at the meeting and, and, and really just creating uh, a, a wider group of individuals to be able to share their expertise and knowledge uh, with those interested in coming to the ARC meetings. And so as we summarize uh, here, just there's a few resources that we want to point out. Uh, we have actually, um, similar to this, this um, presentation, um, Dr. Varikogis and myself and others, we actually uh, have a podcast that you can see there. It's under the AARC Perspectives podcast. Uh, you can see it's called Behind the Scenes Program Committee, where many of these uh, topics were mentioned before, uh, just in a podcast format. So those of you that enjoyed listening to podcasts, please go find that. Always remember that you can go to AARC Connect, uh, one, to monitor what's, you know, monitor the, the trends and or, or ask questions. And this is a great way for you to uh, meet up with uh, your colleagues in your practice interest area uh, for ideas and, and even exchange ideas, for maybe perhaps for a proposal. And then finally, um, you can see on the right, you have the QR code and, and information for the executive office. If you're having any trouble whatsoever with the RFP process or the website or anything, please contact the AARC office and they will be more than happy to help you out. And finally here, just a, a cool little quote here is, you never get a second chance to make a first impression. So as a program committee, I can tell you that we ask that you put your best foot forward here, put the time and the effort in preventing, to, uh, to create, sorry, to create a really strong proposal. As Sarah mentioned, this is, you know, the description is what's gonna be published on the program. Uh, we need to understand what your talk is about. The title, while sometimes they're nifty and, and creative, does the title really tell us what the content is going to be about? So really try your best to put your best foot forward here. Uh, that way we can give, we can um, know and understand what you're trying to talk about and, and send us that information about your expertise so we can make an educated decision. With, with that, Sarah, I'll pass over to you for any final words.
No, I, I think I just want to remind everybody that, you know, spending the time on your proposal, that is your first impression to the program committee. And so it's worth it. It's worth the time. And, and I, I'll just as an anecdote, we, Brady and I both know there's an individual who listened to the podcast and worked on, um, had submitted before um, and was not, it was unclear about why their proposals were not accepted. Listened to the podcast, reformulated yeah. kind of their approach to the title and the objectives and the description and actually was accepted for the first first time um, just this last year. And so, so we hope that that's kind of um, what will be the result of this is that they'll, they'll be able to cultivate even more new speakers um, with, with demonstrated expertise to be able to be put on the committee, um, that the committee will be able to review to put on the program. So thank you for your time. I hope this was helpful to you. And again, the resources are included if you need to reach out to anybody for questions. Thank you. Thanks.